Okay, great. Um, yes, thank you to those of you who were not put off by, uh, by last week and have come back again this week. Um, so we are, this is the second installment of, of web scraping in R. And um, in actual fact, there is going to be precisely zero R in, um, in today's session. Um, although we will be working in R a little bit, well, I will be just to basically build some HTML and CSS documents. But um, what we're going to be doing today is uh, covering a, a lot of the kind of prerequisites that we're going to need in order to, to web scrape efficiently. So we're going to be talking about uh, HTML and then we'll be looking at two ways of identifying content in an HTML document. So we'll be covering CSS and XPath. And then we'll be looking at two tools which are gonna enable us to uh, quickly and easily get the CSS uh, or XPath selectors for specific elements on a page. So we'll be looking at developer tools in your browser and then also a, a, a Chrome plugin called select a gadget. Okay, so let's, um, let's kick off by talking about uh, HTML and maybe just unpacking the acronym initially. So HTML stands for hypertext markup language. And what does that mean to us? Well, it's a it's a language which enables us to to write a document with additional markup and this markup comes in the form of tags which we'll be talking about in a moment and those tags uh, apply uh, or assign particular significance to different portions of the document um, so what does a, an html document typically look like well there's this saying that html is like tag soup and this is what a, a tiny html document might look like what we have here is some content. So for example, the sentence and this uh, section heading. And then we have a whole bunch of tags like the HTML tag and the head tag and the title tag. And these tags are assigning significance to different portions of the document. So for example, this title tag is telling us that everything between the opening tag and the closing tag is the document title. And similarly over here, this H1 tag is telling us that everything between the opening and closing tag is a, a top level document heading. So we're gonna be learning a lot about more about these tags in, in the first section of, of this uh, talk. <clears throat> and then we'll be moving on to talking about CSS and, and XPath. And, and these, these two things, so the HTML, the content of your document and CSS, these enable the, the modern uh, internet. So basically they, they enable the, the pretty web pages that we now see in, in our browsers. Okay, so as I mentioned, your HTML document consists of two components. There's the content, right? So the actual, the text that you see on the page and then there are the tags. And these tags uh, are denoted by co the contents of these angle brackets. So it's always going to be an opening angle brackets and then a closing angle brackets and then the tag name in between. So for example, here we've got a, a P tag, which is used to enclose, so enclose some paragraph content. You've got a table tag. This would delineate a tabular content on a page. And this IMG is an image tag. If you're inserting an, an image onto a page, that's the one that you would use. Now, these tags almost always come in pairs. You've generally got an opening tag and a closing tag. And the difference between opening and closing tag is this forward slash character. So that's the, the only difference between the two. And, um, in general, between these two, the opening and the closing tag, there's going to be some form of, of content. So for example, here, this is a paragraph, that's my content, and it's occurring between the opening and closing tags. There are some exceptions to this. So for example, the image tag, this doesn't actually require any content. And consequently, you can just have an opening tag without a closing tag. Now, 
In addition to the tags and the content between the opening and closing tags, it's also possible to assign attributes to uh, a tag. And what these attributes do is essentially provide um, additional information uh, relating to, to the structure of the document or to the content of the tags. And here are some examples. Again, using the, the a paragraph tag, but now um, looking at three different examples of the align attributes. So we've got align equals left, align equals right, and align equals center. And the effect of these three different attributes is that the paragraph text is either aligned left or right or centered on the page. Now, in modern web design, you wouldn't actually be using an align attribute for this. You'd probably be using uh, CSS to, to style the, the alignment of the, the text content. Nevertheless, the, it's still available as, as an attribute on the paragraph tab, and there are many, uh, paragraph tag at least, and there are many other attributes that we can apply to, to various tags. Okay, so let's take a look then at like the, the high level uh, structure of an HTML document. And this is what that would look like. So the outermost tag is going to be an HTML tag. All right, so we've got the opening HTML tag at the top and the closing tag at the bottom. And between that, you would have normally two pairs of tags. You have the, the head tag and the body tag. And the head tag, normally contains some metadata relating to the, the document. So for example, this is where you would find the, the title of the document. Now the title is not actually what you're going to see rendered on the page. This is the title that's going to appear either in your the toolbar of your browser or in the, the tab for the particular page that you're looking at. Other things that go into the head are uh, references to style sheets, references to JavaScript that's gonna be run in the page. A whole bunch of content can be stuffed into the head, but which is not actually going to appear on the page. And then within the body, well, as the name implies, this is actually where you have the content that's going to be rendered on the page. And most of, of our job as, as web scrapers is going to relate to extracting content from the body of the document. Okay, so we're gonna just run through some of the, the more typical tags that one would encounter uh, in an HTML document. And we're gonna start off with the headings tags. So there is a, a hierarchical structure to the headings in an HTML document. At the, the top level, you've got an H1 heading, and this could be considered like a, a chapter level heading. And then you've got H2, which is maybe a, a section level heading, and then H3, subsection, H4, etc. These are going progressively further down the hierarchy. And when these are rendered on the page, normally they have a progressively declining um, font size. So chapter level, the biggest, and then sections and subsections progressively smaller. Then we have normally interleaved between these uh, section headings. You've got some paragraph text, and as we've seen already, the paragraph text is delineated by these opening and closing paragraph tags. So there's nothing really new there. Images, as I mentioned uh, a few moments ago, this is an exception to the rule that every opening tag has a closing tag. In the case of an image tag, you only actually require the opening tag. And here's an example of where one would use an attribute. So here we have the, the source attribute, which points to the URL from which this image that you see on the right hand side is being retrieved. And the content of this source attribute, it can either refer to a local file on your machine or on the server or to a remote file in which case you'd provide a url like i have here a lot of uh, content that you end up uh, passing for uh, web scraping is tabular and this is what a table looks like a simple table in, in html so you've got the outermost 
table tag. And then within the table, it's divided up into rows and each row is delineated by a row tag, so TR. And then within each of those rows, you've then got um, tags that give you the content for individual cells. So you've got, uh, and there, there are two types of these, right? There's a TH and there's a TD. And the TH is for a header cell. So here we've got a header cell for country and a header cell for population. And you can see that in the rendered table, these are bold, right? And they're centered. And then within the actual data rows of the table, you've, you use the TD tag. So here we've got TD, Tuvalu, and TD and the corresponding population. And here's another example of using an attribute in the tags. If we hadn't assigned this a line equals right, then these population numbers would all be left aligned, just like the country names, which does kind of look rather odd. So if we want our numbers to be all right aligned, which is kind of the conventional way that you would render uh, numerical content in a table, then you need to specify a line equals right. Now, I said this is a, a simple table because you can actually be a little bit more fancy about the way that you uh, create a table. So you can insert an extra level of, of hierarchy within the table tag. You can divide it up into a header with the T head tag, a body, T body tag, and a footer with the T foot tag. And you can see that the header contains just the, the header rows. The footer contains the footer row. And in this case, this is just like a total of the population of the two countries. And then you've got the, the data uh, content in between them. If your table is indeed laid out like this, it does actually make uh, extracting the, the content from that table quite a lot easier because you have another sort of handle for identifying specific elements within the table. Okay, and then there, there are two final tags which I want to, to mention, and these are actually extremely pervasive. Um, the, the div tag and the span tag, and these essentially serve the same uh, purpose. So they are like a general purpose tag. They don't have any specific interpretation like a paragraph or a table or an image. Um, but the difference between the two of them is that the, the div tag is, is a block level uh, tag or container. And what this means is that it, it's going to be rendered separately on the page in much the same way that a, a paragraph is offset relative to the surrounding material. Whereas um, a span is an inline container. And this means that a span is generally used within uh, another tag. And here's an example of what this might look like. So I've got a div here, which is enclosing a, a paragraph tag. And then actually within that paragraph tag, I've got a couple of spans. So these spans are um, surrounding every occurrence of this term ipsum. And you're gonna see when we look at, at using CSS that these div and span tags are very, very useful for assigning uh, particular characteristics to arbitrary content on, on a page. Okay, now, We've, we've looked at the, the tags, uh, which are identified by name. And this is one way that, that we can um, I isolate specific content on a page. But um, there are two other things which are really, really handy for, for identifying content. And those are identifiers and classes. And these serve a, a dual purpose. I mean, for us as, as web scrapers, they're gonna enable us to identify particular content and extract that content. From the browser's perspective, they allow the browser to identify um, individual tags or sets of tags to which uh, specific uh, aesthetics are gonna be applied. So let's take a look at them. 
So a class uh, attribute is something that can be assigned to a, a number of, of different um, tags, right? So you can assign a class to multiple tags. And generally what this class does is it, it produces some common aesthetic that's going to be applied to all of those tags. So for example, here I've picked out the, the first paragraph, um, the third paragraph and this uh, content within the third paragraph and I've assigned to all three of those the class highlight and you can see the results in the rendered document are that the entire first paragraph the entire third paragraph as well as just this single word from the fourth paragraph are highlighted the reason for that is that in my CSS I've got a rule that says Whenever you see this class highlight, you need to take the corresponding content and give it a blue highlight background. Okay, so classes can be applied to multiple elements. Identifiers, on the other hand, can only be assigned to a single element. Right? And here you can see two examples. Here I have an ID first and for, for the first paragraph and I have an ID of last, which is assigned to the last paragraph. Now, in this case, I don't actually have any styling that's been applied to those two tags. But what I'd like to point out is that because your identifier is unique on the page, this is an extremely powerful thing to use if you're doing web scraping. If the content that you, you're looking for is wrapped up in an identifier it means that your life as a web scraper is a lot easier you don't need to do an awful lot of gymnastics to uh, uh, to isolate that particular element the identifier will take you directly to it okay and you know as a the final note here that the classes and identifiers are often applied to div and span tags so it's very seldom that you're going to see either a div or a span that doesn't have a, a class or an identifier associated with it. Okay, so this, this now gives us sufficient knowledge to actually go away and build a simple web page. And that's what we're gonna do right now. Um, and something that I failed to mention at, when I started was that there's now some more content in the same repository that we used last week, uh, two new files uh, and those files are what we're going to be using uh, for, for the exercises. So I'm going to flip over to um, our studio. Uh, these are the two files. There's lab south pole HTML and lab south pole CSS. What we're going to be uh, doing is um, building an HTML page. Uh, initially, we're going to be focusing just on building the content of the page. And then we're going to, after we've learned a bit about CSS, we're going to be styling that page. So overlaying some aesthetics on it. And just an upfront warning, my, my aesthetic appreciation is spectacularly poor. So do not expect this page to look in any way pleasing. Okay, so this is what we're gonna to aim to do. We're gonna create a, a file called southpole.html and then we're going to add in all of this content and we're gonna take a look at how it's, it's um, how it renders in the browser. And if you'd like to follow along, uh, you can do this now. Um, I'm gonna be editing this in, in our studio, but you can edit it in whatever edit, editor you normally use, VS Code or whatever. So I'm gonna start off by creating a new file, um, an HTML file, and I'm gonna save this uh, as, I'm gonna save it in that folder, and I'm gonna call it uh, southpole.html. Okay, now my next instruction is to put together the, the basic structure for an HTML document, right? So the layout of an HTML document, as we saw before, we've got the HTML tag on the outside, and then we've got the head, and we've also got the, the body, like so. Okay, next up, we're going to add a suitable title tag, right? And the page is going to be about South Pole, so... I'm going to say uh, title, the South Pole. 
And at this stage, we can actually go save the file. And I'm going to flip back to the browser and actually open up the file. So I'm in the folder that has the file in it. And there it is, opening it up. And I'm deeply underwhelmed right now because there's absolutely nothing on the page. Not terribly surprising though, we haven't put anything in there. What we can see though, is that since we assigned a title, the tab for this page says the South Pole. We have some progress. Okay, next up, we're going to go and create a top level heading saying the South Pole. Okay, top by top level, I mean an H1 tag. So here it would be H1, the South Pole. And just as an aside, isn't R Studio magnificent? I mean, it's not actually really aimed at rendering HTML, but it does tag completion for you. Phenomenal tool. Um, okay, so there we go. We've put in the, the, the H1 heading. If I refresh, there you go. I've got my, my chapter level heading. And I'm now going to go and add in some more content. So I'm going to add in three section headings, introduction, view, and weather. So these are going to be H2s. So H2 introduction and uh, view and weather. Okay, let's go back, refresh. So there are sections and what's next. Now we're going to go and add some paragraphs to each section. Well, and I've, I've pointed you to this um, website, uh, ipsum.com, which is kind of handy for just generating uh, place filler content. Uh, so I'll open it up over here. And you can actually choose how many uh, paragraphs of content you want. So five should be sufficient. Um, I'll grab three of those right off and go back to our studio. I'm not going to use all of those immediately. Uh, I have some actual original content here. Um, so let's say it's going to be a paragraph tag. Uh, let's say the South Pole is an amazing place. And then we can grab some random text and pop that in as the next paragraph. And mm, Let's take another one of these and pop it in under the weather. And we can say something sensible about the weather in Antarctica. It's cold, I guess that's an understatement. And pop that one in under view. The view is spectacular. somewhat bleak and right so let's go back and take a look at our document now so there we go we've got some textual content the the aesthetics as I mentioned super bland and the reason for that is that there's no styling being applied to this page it's like it's got the default styling from the browser which is basically non-existent um, let's go and add in some more things. So add a suitable image to the second section. Well, we're going to go and cheat by grabbing an image from Wikipedia. Whoops, what about top there? I wanted South Pole, not South Image. Okay, so let's go to Wikipedia and there's a South Pole image. I'm going to just copy the, the link address and go back to our studio. And here in my view section, I'm going to add in an image tag and specify that the source is the URL I've just copied from the browser. Go back to the browser and refresh. That doesn't look good. What have I done? It's not immediately apparent to me what I have broken. So I'm going to just press on. And 
the final thing, uh, the second final thing, is to add a table of average monthly temperatures. And I'm going to be lazy and not stick all of these in. I'll take in some of them. And it's got to go down here. So we're going to put in a table. And we're going to have a number of rows. The first row is just going to have the, the headings. So it's going to be a month uh, for the first one and then temperature for the second one. And let's just paste the temperatures there. Now we can put in some actual data for those. Okay, so let's say the first one is Jan. And then we can have Feb, March, and I think four will be quite sufficient to drive the point home. So and then we can just copy the temperatures across. Okay, take a look at our document again. Still not sure why my image is not rendering. Okay, right. Um, and now we're going to put in some uh, classes and identifiers. So we're going to add the classes odd and even to the odd and even numbered rows in the table. And then we're going to pop in an identifier introduction for the introduction section. So in my introduction section, over here, I'm going to say ID equals introduction. And down here in my table, I'm going to give these classes. So this is going to be an odd row. And this is going to be an even row. Okay, now this those changes are not going to make any difference to the page at the moment, but we're going to use those as handles to apply some styling to the page once we've learned a little bit about CSS. So let's press on to now talking about the next topic, which is CSS. And CSS, well, this is what makes the, the internet look good, right? It's the difference between Melisandre with and without. Um, so to put a bit of context on this, this is what my first experience of the internet looked like. So back in the early 1990s, uh, the internet was a very different place and um, browsers were very kind of utilitarian in the sense that they were really there just to convey content. A lot has changed between now and then and web pages are now quite spectacular. And the reason for that is that we have this CSS, right? So CSS is what enables your browser to produce the, these beautifully aesthetically pleasing pages. Uh, I think the, the separation of, um, of content on a web page is actually rather clever because you've got the, the HTML, which is solely concerned with uh, the content of the page. And then you've got the CSS, which is uh, the styling, how things will appear. So you can change one without changing the other. You know, just by changing the CSS, you can modify the entire appearance of the page without actually messing with the content. And vice versa, you can change the content, but if the CSS remains the same, then the overall aesthetic will remain consistent. Okay, so let's, let's get stylish by applying some CSS to an HTML document. And the first question I guess one should ask is like, how do you insert these styles? And there are three ways of doing it. So there's the, the super old school way of doing that. And that is actually taking uh, an individual tag and inserting styling content into that, that tag, right? So in this case, I've said that I, I want this content, I'm bold, to be rendered with a bold face font. Now, the problem with this is that you need to go and apply the styling information to each and every tag, and this becomes extremely onerous, right? So ideally, what you want to do is have uh, 
some style rules set up somewhere, either within the HTML document or in a separate CSS file. And those rules will then be applied systematically to all of the tags in the page. And there are two ways of doing this. The, the one is that within the, the head of your HTML document, you have a style tag. And within that style tag, you have your CSS. This, this is better than your inline line style option. But the best and the easiest to maintain is if you have your CSS in a separate file. So for example, if I have my CSS in a separate file called styles.css, then within the head of my HTML document, I would have a link tag, which would then refer to this secondary CSS file. And when my browser renders the HTML, it would go and pull the CSS from that file and apply it to my HTML. Okay, so let's have a look at the, the general structure of CSS. And this is what a, a CSS rule looks like. It consists of two parts. So there are the selectors and the declarations. Now, what the selectors do is they are rules for identifying specific components on the page. And we're going to be talking a lot about these rules in the next couple of minutes. And then you have the declarations and the declarations tell uh, the browser what it needs to do to the content that's identified by the selector. So for example, um, the selector might say, pick out all of the section titles on the page and the declarations might say, turn them uh, red and make them bold font. Now, as web scrapers, we're not actually too concerned about the declarations. It's handy to know about them. What we are more concerned about are the selectors because we're going to use the same tools in web scraping that the browser uses to assign aesthetics. The logic being that the, the browser is using these CSS selectors to identify specific components of the page and it's then assigning the aesthetics specified to those components on the page. What we're doing as web scrapers is we're using those same selectors to identify specific components on the page and then we're extracting the information from them. In both cases, the selectors are basically just the tool that's being used to identify specific content. Okay, so here's an example, a very, very simple uh, CSS uh, rule, which says identify all of the paragraphs on the page and apply this declaration to them. In other words, turn the color of all of the paragraphs to red. It's that simple. Okay, that was quite simple, but there are there is actually some complexity associated with CSS as well. In fact, it's fairly fair to say that um, CSS, uh, there's a bit of a zoo of like various different types of uh, CSS selectors. And you, you can probably get away with like just knowing a little bit about CSS. But the more you know, um, the easier your life as a web scraper is going to be. Uh, the reason I'm showing you this uh, Where's Wally uh, picture is that you, the job of the selectors is basically to help you find Wally on the beach or equivalently help you find the content that you're looking for within a specific document. Okay, the simplest type of CSS rule is simply a tag name. And this is exactly the same rule that we saw before, right? We're picking out all paragraph tags on the page and we're assigning a specific style to them. So for example, if we had this content in our HTML document, then the content within this paragraph tag would be rendered in red. However, H1 tags and table tags would be unaffected. Right. Here's another example. We have a rule that um, changes the, the font to italic, and this has been applied to h1 tags. And if this is what I, our HTML looked like, then this rule would be applied to the h1, but it would not be applied to the h2. 
then we have the classes. Remember, these classes are things that we can assign to multiple tags, right? So they're an attribute that you assign to multiple tags. And let's start with the HTML first. Here I've got two paragraph tags that have a class of big. And then I have another two paragraphs that have a class of huge. And what happens here is that in our CSS, we have a CSS rule for big and a CSS rule for huge. A, a class rule uh, can be identified in CSS by the fact that it begins with a period. Okay, so this rule here says whenever you encounter the big class, you need to change the font size and make it two times bigger. Similarly, whenever you encounter the huge class, you need to make the font size four times bigger. Now, these, these CSS rules here are going to be applied to all tags on the page that have this particular class. You can be more specific and say, this is the rule for the big class whenever it's applied to a paragraph tag. And in that case, you would simply amend this selector by putting a P up front. So that selector would then be P dot big. So that rule would then be applied to a, a big paragraph tag, but not to a table or a heading or other tags. Then there's the identifier. Now remember there's only a single uh, unique value of an identifier on a page. Uh, and the way that uh, an identifier is uh, indicated in CSS is with a leading hash. So this rule is going to target this specific tag on the page that has that ID of introduction. If you were aiming to extract this content from the web page, your life would be very easy because your the CSS selector required would be very, very simple. That ID is going to take you directly to what you need. Okay. And you know, if you were aiming to find Wally and Wally had an ID tag on him or had an ID attribute, then you'd be able to go straight to him and find him immediately. Okay. Now there are ways that we can combine these CSS selectors. So for example, if, if you have a, a rule uh, like this, convert uh, the font to italic, and you want this to be applied to multiple different uh, tags on the page, then you can simply separate them with a comma. So any of the selectors that we've seen up till now can be grouped together like this with a comma. And what happens is that the, the contents of the, the declaration are then applied to any tag which matches any one of these selectors. And in a web scraping context, this is very useful because it allows you to target multiple portions of a page that may match uh, various different conditions. So for example, if you wanted to get all of the headings on the page, Right, their contents, then you might have h1, comma h2, comma h3, comma h4. That's the selector that you would use to scrape that content. Now, I didn't really mention this at the beginning, but um, an a, a HTML document also has a, a hierarchical structure in the sense that it consists of tags within tags within tags. Right, you've got the HTML tag on the outside and then within that you've got a, a head tag and a body tag and within the body you're going to have you know maybe some divs and within those divs you might have some paragraphs and within those paragraphs you might have some spans and so there's this hierarchy of um, tags on the page and we can use this hierarchy to also hone in on specific items on the page and there are two basic relationships that, that we are concerned with here. The one is a descendant relationship and the other one is a child relationship. And I'll tell you what the difference between those is right now. So descendants are whenever a tag occurs anywhere within another tag. So for example, here I've got, I've got a div tag 
And within that div, I've got a paragraph tag. And then I've also got another div tag. And within that, I've got yet another paragraph tag. And then I've got a separate paragraph tag, which is outside of the div. Now, what the selector here is going to do for us is it's going to look firstly for a tag that has this outer class, right? And that hones our attention in on this div, right? So this, this paragraph here is immediately out of the picture. And then following on after the outer class, we have this P tag. So we're now looking for a paragraph tag whenever it is a descendant of a tag with an outer class. So this paragraph tag there matches because it's within the div with the outer class. But so does this one here because it also is enclosed within that outer class. So basically this descendant relationship allows you to take one point in the tree structure and basically look everywhere beneath that point or that node in the tree. By contrast, the child selector is looking for an immediate descendant, right? one which is immediately enclosed within the outer one. And the only difference to the CSS notation is this greater than sign. So this is saying find all paragraph tags when they are a child or an immediate descendant of another tag with this outer class. So looking over here, I've got two paragraph tags, but only the first one is going to be selected because it is a child of this div, whereas this one has got another level of hierarchy between it and the div, and consequently it's not an immediate descendant or descendant at least, or a child. So that's the kind of the hierarchical relationship parent, child, and further descendants. You can also identify tags as being siblings. And this is also a very handy selector, the adjacent sibling, where you're basically saying, give me a particular tag whenever it is uh, a sibling, in other words, at the same level in the hierarchy, and also adjacent to another tag. So here I'm looking for a paragraph tag whenever it is an adjacent sibling to another tag with this big class. So here I've got a paragraph with class big and this adjacent sibling, it's a sibling because it's at the same level, is going to be selected because it satisfies this rule. Okay, so those are the, the basic uh, selectors. And we're not gonna be talking about using uh, attributes to um, identify specific content. And these attribute selectors are, are also remarkably useful. And we're gonna see the first ones are gonna be simply looking at uh, identifying tags with a specific value of an attribute. And then we're gonna look at a way of, of kind of generalizing this to basically do some pattern matching within the attributes as well. So here, for example, I've got two image tags. One has a width of 50% and another one has a width of 100%. And I'm using an attribute selector to hone in on the first one. So the syntax for this is that we have a tag and then within square brackets, we've then named a particular attribute. So width matches to the, the width attribute in the tag and we specified a particular value. So this is going to identify all images on the page where the width is 50% right? But we can generalize this. So we have these operators, right? Uh, carrot equals, dollar equals, and asterisk equals. And the interpretation of these, so carrot equals is begins with, dollar equals is ends with, and uh, asterisk equals is contains. So this rule here is looking for any A, an anchor tag, so this is a link, that has an href attribute that begins with mail to. So of these three anchor tags, it's only going to match the second one because it begins with mail to. 
This one is an ends with, so we're gonna match anchor tags where the href attribute ends with PDF. So again, of these three, only the second one matches because it ends with PDF. And then finally, the contains, we're looking for the source of an image containing the text logo. And of these three, only the second one has logo in the source attribute. These are, are remarkably handy things to, to use for identifying content. Okay, so let's, let's do some styling. Um, uh, there, there, is, there is some more to, to these slides, but I'm gonna skip over these um, for the moment because they're not actually particularly uh, germane to what we're gonna be talking about. Let's go back and add some styles to, to our document. So I'm going to flip back to our studio and take a look at my second set of assignments. And we're not going to create a separate CSS file. We're going to be lazy and simply put in a style tag in the head. So style, and we're going to be inserting our, our CSS declarations directly into the, the HTML. And the first thing we're going to do is we're gonna change the font for the whole document to sans serif. And here are some hints as to what we need to do. So we're gonna be targeting the whole document. So our selector is going to be aimed at the body tag. And we're going to use the font family property to modify that tag. So our rule should look something like this. So body, and then we're gonna use font family. Uh, sans serif and if we go back to our document and everything has gone according to plan then the serif font should be replaced by a sans serif font okay good it's progress okay so next up we're going to go and change the color of the introduction heading to red okay we, there is an identifier on that introduction um, section title. So we're gonna use that identifier and we're going to use the color property. So just to remind ourselves, there's the ID introduction. So our CSS rule now looks like this. So hash introduction, and we're going to set the color to red. And if we refresh our document, we go we've got a red introduction now what's next so for the odd table rows convert the background color to gray and the foreground color to white so we're going to target the the correct class so remember we added the odd and even classes to the rows in the table and we're going to use the background color and color properties so we're targeting a class so dot odd for the odd class we've got background uh, ground color, I'm being lazy, it's going to be gray and the foreground color is going to be white. Let's take a look at our table. There we go. So those odd rows have now changed their appearance. And the last thing here is we're going to right align the temperature values in the tables. Okay. And we're going to use uh, the text align property, so the text align right, and we're gonna use an adjacent sibling selector to do this. And the idea here is that we're going to use the fact that we're aiming to uh, style this TD tag, and that is adjacent to another TD tag. So something like this should work, TD, adjacent TD, and we're going to do text align, right, all right. So they're left aligned at the moment, and when we refresh, they're now right aligned. So, right, we've applied some <laughs> very rudimentary aesthetics to this page um, that have changed the appearance, but the same principles and the same ideas 
or, or what we're going to be applying when we do some web scraping as well. So you'll be identifying portions of the page using these selectors and then we're going to be extracting the corresponding content. Okay, three more topics, half an hour. Um, I'm going to have to pick up the pace, clearly. Um, the first thing I, I wanted to talk about is, is XPath. And XPath is a, another way of accessing content on a page. It's like CSS. Um, and in fact, you know, you can either choose to, to do your web scraping with CSS or XPath. Um, I, I'm, I almost exclusively use CSS. However, there are some situations in which I like to um, drop down to XPath just because there are some things that it does that are not available in CSS. Okay, so XPath is, is a, a way of identifying content and it's, it's, arranged, it's originally intended to be used on XML documents, but HTML is a subset of XML and that means that XPath works for HTML documents as well. Now, the idea with um, XPath is that it def it treats everything in your document as a node. There are seven types of nodes in XPath, but we're only concerned with the first three. So elements, attributes, and text. And as I mentioned earlier, it, it views the, the document as a hierarchy. So you've got the, the document root at the top, and then you've got this HTML tag. The HTML tag contains a head tag and a body tag. Within the head, in this thing, fictitious document, I've got a title tag, all right? These in blue are all element nodes or tags as we've been referring to them in the context of HTML. And then we've got a couple of text nodes as well. So inside the title tag, I've got text. And inside the H1 tag, I've got some more text. And inside the, the paragraph tag, I've got yet some more text. And then navigating all the way down to the bottom of the tree here, I've got an anchor tag that has both text. So that the word that you would see on the page would be Google and you'd be able to click on that and it would then take you to the value specified by the href attribute. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to skip over that and start talking about the syntax in an XPath. And, the name XPath kind of implies that what it's doing is defining a path that allows you to navigate the, the document. And there, as we'll see in a moment, there are two types of paths, absolute and relative. But the, the principle is that you start at the top of the tree and you navigate down the tree by using this path, which is normally just a succession of um, node names or identifiers that will ultimately get you to what you're looking for. Okay, so we'll start off by talking about absolute and relative paths. So this is what a, an X, uh, X path, um, path looks like. And this is an absolute path because it begins with a single slash. That single slash uh, corresponds to the, the root of the tree. And what this is saying is start off at the root of the tree then find the HTML tag. Within the HTML tag, find a body tag, and within the body fi tag, find a paragraph tag. So if we go back, HTML body paragraph, that's, that's the paragraph tag over on the right there that would be identified by this rule. Equivalently, here's the HTML, within that a body, and within that uh, two paragraph tags. Then we've got a relative path. Now, what a relative path does is it doesn't begin at the top of the tree, right? It's got this double slash at the beginning. And this basically means like skip a whole lot of structure in the tree until you find something that matches. So in this case, skip all of the structure in the document until you find some paragraph tags. So in this case, rather than identifying only those paragraph tags that occur with directly within the body, so these two, we now end up with all of these tags because we specified a relative path and it's basically said, whenever you find a paragraph tag, we'll take it. Okay, children and descendants. So this, these are the same children and descendants that we chatted about in the context of CSS. Uh, so it's either a direct descendants relationship or somewhere beneath another tag in the hierarchy. And the way that it 
direct descendant is indicated in XPath is by a single slash separating two tags. So for example, here I've got um, a relative path. So I'm saying, look, anywhere within document for a body tag. And then within that body tag, I want you to find an immediate or child uh, tag. So an immediate descendant or child descend, uh, um, descendant. So this would match only these two paragraph tags because they are immediate descendants of the body tag. And what about descendants? Well, the descendants actually look very much like the, the relative paths, right? So here we're saying, give me a paragraph tag whenever it is a descendant of a body tag, right? So it's gonna match all three of these paragraph tags enclosed within the body. Right, the predicates are, are where um, XPath comes into its own. So the first ones are basically position predicates. So as we saw um, back here, a, an XPath rule can give you multiple matches. How do you identify specific uh, matches within that uh, selection? Well, one way of doing that is by specifying a numerical index. So the indexing starts at one, and this is saying, find me uh, the, the first paragraph tag that is a child of the, the body, right? So that matches this. Then you can also, within these parentheses, like this kind of indexing operator, you can also use this position function which basically, yeah, I mean, you can think of it as returning the positions of each of those tags in kind of the sequence in which they are selected. And here, for example, I'm saying, give me all paragraph tags where the position is less than three. So in other words, the first and second paragraph tags, which would give me back this. Okay, you can see that now there are a variety of ways of getting to the same target and this applies to both uh, CSS and, and XPath. There's also this last function that allows you to get the last tag that is selected from a group. So here this that XPath would give me multiple paragraph tags and I'm simply here saying give me the last of them which would identify this one and you can also do maths on this. So for example if you want the second to last you'll then take last minus one you can minus two, minus three, etc. Okay, um, this is where we're getting towards the more powerful aspects of uh, XPath. I'm gonna skip over this. You, you can do kind of um, isolation of uh, entities in the page by using um, attributes. So for example, here I'm saying, just find me all paragraphs that have an align attribute uh, specified. So it doesn't matter whether it's left or right, as long as it has an align attribute, we get to pick it out. But we can also be specific. For example, here, I only want paragraphs that are right aligned. So that's gonna pull out that one. And there are also these three really handy functions that give us essentially the same capabilities that we saw earlier in the context of CSS. So the, those three operators, uh, we can specify whether something it needs to start with, end with, or contain some specific content. So, and the way these are used is again, within the, the um, square brackets operator, we use the starts with function. We specify the href attribute. And in this case, we're wanting something that starts with HTTPS. And so for this chunk of H HTML, it would only match the first, um, the first anchor link anchor tag on the page. Um, right, okay. This, this is really the reason that I, I wanted to include XPath here. And this is a feature that is not possible in, in CSS, but can be extremely useful. And that is that matching um, tags on a page based on their content. And the way that we do that is with this text function. So here I'm asking for all paragraphs on the page that enclose the text first paragraph. So this would match only that tag, right? The other ones have different text content. 
you can replace this text function with uh, the normalize space function. And what that will do is trim off leading and trailing white space on either side of the content. This can be useful, but it's, it's generally not something that's terribly handy. What is super handy is using those three functions that we saw a moment ago, right? We can check on whether the text content in a tag either contains or starts with or ends with a particular uh, bit of text. And here, for example, give me back all paragraphs that contain the word paragraph in their text. And in this case, that would match all three of these paragraph tags. We could change this around. And instead of using contains, we could say uh, starts with and specify first, in which case it would only identify the first tag, the first paragraph tag. Okay, final thing, as we saw with the, um, with the CSS, we can group these things together with CSS, we separate them with a comma. In the case of XPath, we just separate them with the, the pipe sign. Okay, enough of, of XPath. Um, your mileage with, with XPath uh, might vary. It's super handy. I personally find it a little bit more difficult to wrap my head around an XPath selector. But you, as we're going to see in a moment, you can actually get um, XPath selectors generated for you um, within developer tools. Okay, which is our next topic. So the last two things we're going to be talking about now are ways to, um, ways to get either CSS or XPath selectors directly from an HTML document. Um, and although it's possible to use these two tools like developer tools and selector gadget, um, they, will, they will almost always give you what you want. Knowing a bit about HTML structure and CSS or XPath will allow you to either make your selectors a little bit more uh, compact uh, or do things that you just actually can't do with either of the tools that we're going to talk about now. Okay, so developer tools first. Developer tools is something that comes in your browser for free, right? You don't need to install anything extra in order to take advantage of developer tools. So this is a, a fictitious uh, web page designed by me and styled by me. You can see that by the fact that the aesthetics are um, appalling. Um, but the idea here is that I can take this page and I can open up developer tools inside my browser. And I do that by either right clicking on the page and then selecting inspect or by hitting the F12 key on my keyboard. And when I do that, a new panel will open up inside my browser, which is what you can see on the right hand side here. And within that panel, you will see the not only the underlying HTML content for the page, but you'll also see the styling and the CSS that's been applied to that element. And the nice thing about this, as I'll demonstrate in just a moment, is that as you navigate around the, CS, the HTML on, within developer tools, the corresponding content on the page gets highlighted. So for example, you can see on the left hand side here, first section has been highlighted. And the reason for that is that the first section tag uh, is selected on the right hand side. Okay, so let's look at something a little bit more practical. Um, let's go to Google, right? So open up Google in your browser, and then either right click and select inspect or hit the F12 key. And immediately, uh, developer tools will open up. And you can then see the HTML content within the page. And you can then use that HTML content to actually get the selectors. So you would click on a particular item on the page and then go, you would right click on it, go to the copy, uh, the copy uh, item in the, in the menu. And then you have some choices. You can either copy selector that will give you the CSS selector for that element, or you can copy the X path depending on, on your particular inclination. Okay. So let's, Let's find some CSS selectors. What I'm wanting to do now is uh, explore the languages on Google. So what other languages are offered on Google and find the, the CSS selectors for them. So let's do precisely that. 
I'm going to go across to Google. Um, they're ready and I'm going to activate developer tools. I'm going to right click and choose inspect and there's developer tools. And of course, I don't see languages here because I haven't actually gone to Google. So I need to go to google.com. Right, so now I can see at the bottom here, I've got the other languages that are suggested for me. I'm gonna right click on one of these Afrikaans and choose inspect again. And you'll see that the developer tools on the right hand side is now updated and it's expanded some of the, of the HTML. And now if I go and highlight this in developer tools, the corresponding element in HTML is highlighted. If I go and click the Sasoto one, Isi Zulu, Isi Kosa, all of these, right? These are the things that I'm interested in. If I wanna get the CSS selector for one of those, I'm gonna go and right click, go to copy uh, and choose copy selector. And if I flip back to our studio and I'm just gonna open a new text file to paste that into, right. That's what it's telling me is the selector that will get me to uh, the first language. Let's see what happens if I right click on the second language. So grab the selector there, right? That's the second language. You can see that something, there's a pattern emerging right here. I've got this nth child one, nth child two. So this, this pseudo class is not something that I spoke about um, earlier, but it's, it's a, another refinement to CSS. Um, if we go back here, we can also get the XPath selector. So copy, copy XPath, All right? And there's the, as I said, somewhat more cryptic uh, XPath selector. All of these will get you to the same content on the page. Now, the other thing that I wanted to show you in the context of developer tools is something that's kind of fun, and that is with developer tools, you can actually modify the contents of, of a page. So for example, here, um, this Google search button, I'm gonna right click on that and choose inspect. And now that input element is highlighted on the right hand side here. I can actually go and modify it. I can change its um, background color. I'm gonna set that to red. Um, and what have I not done quite right here? Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Offhand, I'm not exactly sure why that is not working. It certainly worked when I did it earlier today. Anyway, I'm <laughs> given the time, I'm not gonna let that derail me. Um, so you, you can change the styling on these things, take my word for it. Uh, let's try another one here. Uh, let's go and see Google offered in, so we can change this color there to red. There we go. Okay, so I've, I've restyled content on the page, changed that from black to red. The other thing that you can do is go and actually change the text content. Um, so for example here, this uh, button has I'm feeling lucky on it. You can change that. You can say something like roll the dice. And the content on the page is modified. This is kind of fun. I mean, you can prank people by modifying these pages. Okay. So developer tools, apart from messing with pages, is gonna enable you to get the CSS and XPath selectors. The other thing that will enable you to do that, and which is even more powerful, is Select a Gadget. And Select a Gadget is, is a, a, um, an add-on that you can install in Chrome. Actually, you can see it up in the top right-hand side of my Chrome over there. That, there's my Select a Gadget. I'm going to quickly run you through these slides and then demo how this works. So Select a Gadget is an extension and it allows you to quickly and easily get the, the right CSS selector for what you want. The, and I say the right CSS selector because um, developer tools is superb in the sense that it will give you a CSS selector, but that CSS, that selector may not be precisely what you're looking for. So potentially it might 
select the content that you're after, but it may also select a lot of content on the page that you don't actually want. With select a gadget, you can, uh, you can interactively refine your selection until you only get the content that you're interested in. Okay, there's a little video on the, the web page for select a gadget, which I encourage you to, to watch. It's like just over a minute long and it explains the functionality, but I'm gonna demo it now, which will hopefully uh, give you the idea of how it works. These are basically the instructions for how you go about using the select a gadget. So you activate it and you then go and click on a particular item that you're interested in. And what will happen is that item will be highlighted, but potentially many items, many other items on the page will also be highlighted. What you then need to do is go and have a look at the items that you don't want, but which are highlighted, click on them. They will then become highlighted in red, which means that they will be excluded from the selection. And if at this point, the only things highlighted in yellow are the things that you're interested in, then you're good to go. You've got the, the CSS selector that you're looking for. If there's other content that you want to include, you can then go and click on that content as well. And basically you iterate through this procedure of including content and then excluding things that you don't want until you end up with precisely what you're aiming at. So here's a simple example. Here I'm on the medium homepage. I wanted to have the CSS selector for this first uh, lozenge here that says future. So I clicked on it. And what then happened was that all of the other lozenges on the page were highlighted in yellow, as were these links at the top here, subscribe, write, and sign in. I then went and clicked on one zero, and that excluded all of the other lozenges. And then I went and, and clicked on the get started button at the bottom. And at that point, I knew that I had precisely the CSS selector I wanted because in the bottom right hand side here, which is where the actual gadget lives, you can see there's a button that says clear and after it there are parentheses with a one in them. And that indicates that there's only one item on the page being selected. And then just to the left of that, you can see the corresponding CSS selector. So it's .ea, so it's identifying the EA class and then pulling out the first child, so nth child one. Right, let's demo this. So what we're gonna do is go across to uh, Hacker News and we're going to launch the selector gadget. So we'll start it up and you can see that it's appeared in the bottom right hand corner of my browser. And then we're going to go and find the CSS selector for the title of each of the news items. And there are going to be 30 uh, items on the page. So I expect there to be 30 matches. So I'm going to, as you see, as I move around the page, you can see this orange uh, selection is going a little bit crazy. I'm going to go and select the title for the first article. I click on it. And if I look down on the right hand side here, I can see it says clear brackets 30. And that means that I have uniquely identified all of the 30 titles on this page. And then all I need to do is copy the corresponding CSS, which is the story link class. And I can immediately go and access those titles. Okay, that was a simple one. Part two is find the CSS selector for the comments on each of the news items. So I'm gonna go back here. I'm going to clear the current selection and let's just zoom in here a little bit. You can see that underneath each of these titles, there's uh, 49 comments, 64 comments, etc. Let's click on that, right? Oh, oh my, right? So I've selected the comments, but I've also selected a bunch of things that I don't want. If we just take a look at the corresponding CSS selector though, it's telling us that the, the current selector is the anchor tag. So what it's really done is it's identified all of the links on the page. Clearly we don't want all of the links. So now we can start to eliminate things that we don't want. So I, I know for certain that I don't want the login. So I'm gonna go and click on that, right? That's immediately dropped the number of items selected down to 118, right? I don't want this hide button. So I'm gonna go and click on that, uh-huh. That's dropped the selections down to 44. I've still got these things up here though. Let's get rid of those, All right? Those are gone. 
So I'm now down to 29 selections. And as I scroll down the page, I'm just looking for things that are, are now selected. So there's my first comments. Then all the things in yellow are the other things selected, right? This one here doesn't actually have any comments. So there's nothing selected there. Comments, 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 all the way to the bottom. There's nothing here that's been selected that I don't want. So this is my final CSS selector that I'm going to want. It's that simple. Okay, let's let's try this on something else. Like let's go to to Reddit. Now this is this is a bit more interesting. Right? We're going to again launch the selector gadget, and we're now going to once again aim to get the CSS selector for the title of each of the items. And the first page on Reddit has 20 items, so we're looking for 20 matches. Oh, there we go. So let's fire up the selector gadget. All right, and I'm going to go and click on the title for the first item. And I see that I'm get, I've got 23 selections here. So there are clearly things that I don't want. Here is one that I don't want. I'm going to click on that. Whoops. Okay. So by excluding that one, I've now only left, left with the first title and all of the remaining titles have been excluded. This is not a problem though, because what I can do now is I can add more content back in again. So I've got the first title. I'm now going to add in the second title as well. Aha, right. So including selecting the first one and the second one, but excluding that one gives me 20 matches. And here is the selector that I end up with. Now, if I compare this selector to all of the selectors that we've seen up till this point, then this looks like random noise. And there's a very good reason for that. And that is that Reddit specifically is designing their site to make your job as a web scraper a lot more difficult. So these class names are essentially just random text. So they're very, very difficult to use systematically. So if you come back and you browse this page again, you're going to find that these class names will have changed so if your scraper is relying on these particular class names, it's no longer going to work. So if you're aiming to crawl Reddit, for example, you're going to have to be a little bit more clever about how you go about targeting content on the page. So I, I wouldn't say that this is a case in which um, Selector Gadget has failed. Selector Gadget has worked perfectly. It's done precisely what it's meant to do, but the results that it's produced are just not spectacularly helpful due to the way that the site is actually built. Okay, final example, and that is Stack Overflow. But I think maybe rather than doing this, which is more or less the same as what I've done for the last two sites, it might be make, might make more sense to just answer a couple of questions in the, the last few minutes that remain. Is that okay, Astrid? My pleasure. Well, if there are no questions, I get to go and eat my dinner early. Okay, well then just to, to wrap things up. Um, <laughs> yes. So we, we are recording the session and we will make it available. It'll be up tomorrow. And thank you, Farah. Um, yeah, so to just, just to sum up, um, as you've seen at the end, um, there are two great tools for helping you get those CSS selectors. So developer tools and selector gadget are phenomenal and they will get you like 95% of the way to anything that you need 
um, with CSS. But knowing a little bit about the way that CSS and XPath work underneath the hood is definitely going to be to your advantage because you know for that 5% where developer tools and or select a gadget lets you down, being able to actually go into the HTML, scrounge around and figure things out for yourself is super handy. Actually, just just now that I'm thinking about it. Okay, so this is a this is a great example, and, and if you'll humor me for just a moment, I'll I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so we're gonna go and take a, a look at, at Stack Overflow. And what we're gonna do, I'm gonna skip over this first one and uh, I'm gonna go for this one here. And this is find the CSS selector for the next pagination link. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go down to the bottom. And uh, right, so there's this link right, for next. Go fire up selector gadgets and I'm going to go and click on the next button. Right, and you can see that it highlights all of these other buttons there. So I'm gonna exclude those. Right, and that one, right? So I, I now have got only one selection, but if I take a look at that selector, right, it's, it's pretty intense, right? There's a lot going on there. But if we go back to the document itself uh, and I'm gonna kill select a gadget, I'm going to open up developer tools and go down and find that tag and right click on it and choose inspect. I see here that it is an A tag, it's an anchor tag, and that it has this attribute rel equals next. And what I'm gonna do now, just to ensure that there's only one of these is search for rel equals next. So there are no, no other occurrences in the page. In fact, if I just go and search for next, uh, so that's, there, there's the occurrence here in the, the rel attribute in the text. And then there's a third one, which is up here in some embedded JavaScript. So this rel equals next is unique on the page. So this means that I could actually simplify this and replace it with this selector, right? Because I know that that is going to pick out only the anchor tags that have rel equals next as their attribute. So this is what select a gadget gives you. And this is what you end up with by knowing something about the way CSS works. Yes, th th there is for sure. I mean, there, there's definitely that. You always want your things to be as concise as possible, I guess. And my feeling is that this is more likely to break than that. You know, that changes to the structure of the page are more likely to cause that selector to no longer work than this one, which is just more concise and consequently more robust in my experience. For sure. Okay, so now that we know everything about CSS and XPath, we can actually dig into the real content and that is extracting material from web pages. And so over the next two weeks, we're gonna be doing two things. Next week, we're going to be uh, extracting content from static sites. So in other words, sites that are rendered on the server and where the entire text content is delivered to us intact. And then the week after that, We'll be looking at scraping dynamic sites like LinkedIn, for example, where uh, JavaScript is running locally on your browser and, and rendering some of the content. So the tools that we'll be learning next week for scraping static sites will no longer work and we'll have to resort to some other tools for actually uh, rendering the JavaScript ourselves. So we'll be using a tool called Selenium, which is a basically a browser that you can drive in code. It's intended for, for testing, but it works magnificently for scraping too.